Welcome everyone, I'm sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna get started. <laughs> My name is Mari Castaneda, I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts in Communication and also affiliated with the Center for Public Policy Administration. And I wanted to welcome you all for um, one of the events that we're here uh, celebrating the visit of Pete Tradish as part of the Five College Public Policy Initiative uh, and also the Social Justice pra uh, pol pra Policy Practitioner in Residency. Um, Pete has actually, this is the second week that he's here and did a whole slew of events last week and also has been doing events this week. And I just wanted to share a little bit about some of the things that he's been involved in since uh, arriving here at, uh, in the Valley. Uh, last week he met with um, students from Dean Tech High School uh, in Holyoke in order to build little <laughs> transmitters and get the students of thinking of themselves as not just sort of radio, in terms of radio, but also uh, as engineers. And it was, I think maybe he might say a little bit, a couple of words about that experience of working with the high school students uh, and actually continued on Monday to wrap up some of that, uh, that work with them. Uh, he also gave a public talk last Monday uh, that started off the, the residency at UMass um, and was focusing on Voice for the Voiceless from around the world. Um, and then also has been visiting various different five college uh, classes uh, in the five colleges in order to both share about his experience and his expertise. And last night had uh, a class with uh, a group of students from the School of Education and that was about um, language, but also in terms of the various different work that he was doing with uh, radio stations around uh, the world. So I wanted to thank our five, our various different sponsors, Department of Communication, the Center for Public Policy and Administration, uh, Five Colleges, Inc., um, and also the actual program itself, which is the Five College Public Policy Initiative um, that's under, in which the Social Justice uh, Policy Practitioner in Residency uh, program and grant is located. Um, the plan is that we're gonna have Pete um, actually speak for a few, well, probably for about 40 minutes, he'll be doing a presentation as folks will be probably coming in, and then we're gonna open it up for dialogue and discussion uh, for the remaining time for about half an hour or so, just so that we can wrap up on time, because I know folks have other things to do and dinner and so forth, but we wanna make sure that we have time for dialogue and discussion. Um, and I did wanna point out several of my colleagues. So Martha Fuentes Bautista, who helped coordinate the uh, residency event. Uh, and then also Susan Newton and Michael Lumson, who were helping with both the program, um, the grant and programming and uh, public relations, but also just in supporting the, the visit of Pete Tradishu. Is, uh, has a long history here in the Valley in terms of advocacy uh, work and then also in terms of, of uh, larger sort of discussions about um, policy issue with regards to media. So with that, I'll hand it over to, to Pete. So let's welcome him. Um, thanks so much. I also wanted to mention, although Everyone here already knows it, but we also have Francis Crow here in the audience who has a long <laughs> history of radio. In the um, I won't incriminate her with any of the details, <laughs> um, but uh, but um, suffice it to say, instrumental in uh, in in getting some radio work going even before uh, uh, there were licenses to be had for such things. Um, and so, super, super fun to, to have her here with us. Okay, so this is uh, Mbana Kantaka, uh, and uh, he lived in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, when he was 17, 18, he went to a party and he got beat up by the police. And he lost, uh, he lost uh, part of his sight. Uh, and, uh, and so he's, uh, he's pretty much uh, been blinded ever since. He lived in uh, a housing project, and he always kind of carried a little bit of a chip on his shoulder about that. And so he um, joined a group called the Tenants' Rights Association that was advocating for the people in the, in the housing project. Um, not being able to see, uh, you know, he had a different perspective. Some people there thought that they should start a newsletter. He said, you know, you know, who's really reading here anyway? Let's start a radio station. And everyone was like, well, that's illegal. And he was like, well, what are they going to do to me? Um, and um, he kind of, uh, uh, he, he sent away for a radio transmitter from Canada um, for, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars. He set it up in his living room, and he started uh, Black Liberation Radio 
Um, they later changed the name to Human Rights Radio. And um, he broadcast like that for about three years before anyone outside the housing projects noticed. But what happened one day was a friend of his was walking home with his son, and they were targeted by police, and they were beaten up, and uh, Mbano went to the hospital and interviewed him, taped an interview with him, and broadcast it on the radio station, um, which again, the authorities really didn't know very much about. Um, well, the next day, there were big protests to this you know, police brutality incident, and the next week, the FCC showed up, and they told him, well, we're very concerned you might be interfering with aircraft signals between you know, airplanes flying in the sky and towers, and no airports anywhere near there, no, you know, none of that. Um, so uh, Kentako, being the, the, the kind of crazy dude he is, he, uh, he took his transmitter and he went down in front of the federal building, you know, basically the post office in Springfield, and he said, all right, and he called all the press. He said, I'm presenting myself for arrest. <laughs> you know, anyone here want to arrest me for operating without a license? And he basically, you know, just sort of laid it out. It wasn't airports and air traffic control you were worried about. It was the demonstrations that happened last week that you were worried about. And last time I checked, the FCC is supposed to prevent interference. Sure, you should have come three years ago if that was what you were worried about. But if you're worried about freedom of speech, that, I don't think that's your jurisdiction. I, I would love it if you arrested me. <laughs> Not arrested. <laughs> and um, he was actually kind of left alone for, for several years after that. There was, oh God, like, you know, don't, I don't even want to mess with this guy. And so he operated without a license for you know, several years, and people started to take notice. One person who took notice, uh, oh, and here's another. Uh, picture of Mbana. You know, one thing about this story, everyone talks about Mbana, no one talks about Dia, who <coughs> really kind of holds the thing together. Dia Kentako, his wife. And uh, you don't see, uh, his two daughters uh, are also like very, very involved in the station. So it's actually a, um, it's kind of a family radio station more than anything else. And if you look online, you can hear like all these um, rap songs that his, he wrote, his two, his two daughters perform and stuff. So another uh, key moment was this guy, um, suitably disguised, um, Stephen Donifer. Stephen Donifer heard about the Kentaco case in 1992. And Stephen Donifer was part of a series of protests uh, against the, the first war in Iraq. And he looked at the newspapers, and he saw that in the newspapers, you know, he went to the protest. There's 100,000 people on the streets of San Francisco trying to stop the war. He looked on the TV station. It said, oh, like, you know, about 14 people and like a mangy dog showed up to this protest and, you know, totally minimized the impact of the protests and minimized the opposition to the war. He was so frustrated that by that. And he just happened to be an engineer that he decided he was going to tinker around with trying to figure out another way around the corporate ownership of the media. So he built a transmitter and he took it in a backpack. And you can see, you know, Berkeley in the background. He's up in the hills, just sort of camping out, talking about the imperialist agenda, blah, 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 you know. Um, and, uh, so he did that for a while, and then he was caught. And the, um, the FCC agents came and they caught him, and they said, you gotta pay us $10,000 or you go to jail. Uh, and he said, you know, I don't have $10,000, leave me alone. Went back and forth for a while. His, he got dragged into court, and the FCC, he just kept on doing it and doing it. And so uh, he got dragged into court, and he had some very clever lawyers at the National Lawyers Guild. And basically, they looked at the law and they said, yes, the FCC has jurisdiction over the airwaves. Yes, the FCC can limit freedom of speech on the airwaves, but only to the extent that they have to to prevent chaos, you know, to make sure that everyone has their own channel. Now, but they're supposed to do so in a, in a manner that is the least harmful to the First Amendment that is possible under the law. 
And so they said, okay, look, my client has zero radio stations. Clear Channel has 1,200 radio stations. So tell me how that is the least harmful to the First Amendment rights of the population. Um, you know, that's the least, the least harmful to the First Amendment system you can come up with. The FCC sort of hemmed and hawed. The judge in the case, uh, Claudia Wilkin, she was like, hmm, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and because she didn't know, she refused to grant an injunction against Stephen Dunham. <laughs> and so the FCC lawyer is like, wait a second, Judge Wilkin, you're, you're opening up a can of worms you don't even understand here. And she's like, well, no, he's free to broadcast until I make my ruling. And uh, so he, he went from being in the hills to he opened up a storefront and he set up a transmitter and he broadcast and he, within like a two, three months, he had 150 programmers coming in every week and just like all kinds of, you know, community involvement. Claudia Wilkin did not decide on that case for four years. <laughs> Finally, she did decide against him, but, uh, you know, it was on the technicality. But, you know, that sort of made some news in the circles I traveled in. And so we were all like, wow, you know, if we ever wanted to start a radio station, I guess this is the right time to do it. Because, you know, uh, the FCC's authority over this and their traditional way of just hoarding the licenses for Clear Channel and corporations is not operational right now. So uh, that was... Uh, Stephen Dunifer's case, and he later started selling radio kits, and we bought one of them. I have to say, he's a better anarchist than, uh, you know, businessman particularly. Um, we had a very hard time putting together his kits. Um, we burned up a couple in the course of things, and smoked them up. Um, but uh, a, a tremendously uh, courageous figure, and still working on radio now, and, and now, uh, you know, he still sells radio stations that, that go around the world. So that led uh, me and my bunch of friends, uh, you know, we were all activists in Philadelphia. We were part of different movements. Uh, some of us were in ACT UP, some of us, you know, working on AIDS issues, some of us working on housing, some of us working on environmental, against war. And uh, we decided, okay, let's, let's start a radio station. Let's start a pirate radio station. And, um, you know, a lot of us also were kind of into pirates. It was before Johnny Depp and the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> um, this guy in particular was, uh, was a, uh, I'm a big fan of Captain Sam Bellamy. Uh, and he basically says, uh, though you are a sneaking puppy, and so are all of you who submit to be governed by laws which rich men have made for their own security. For the cowardly whelps have not the courage otherwise to defend what they get by their knavery. But damn you all together, damn them for a pack of crafty rascals, and you who serve them for a parcel of hen hearted numbskulls. They vilify us, the scoundrels do, when there is only this difference. They rob the poor under the cover of law, for so, whatever, for so. <laughs> and we plunder the rich under the protection of our own cover courage. Had you better make one with us than sneak after these villains for employment? So we were like, pirates, they were cool. They were like, you know, they were, um, you know, uh, in a time when most people were enslaved by governments, when people were, you know, dragged into the English Navy and made to fight wars for the rich, um, they had carved out these little zones of independence. Um, and, you know, a lot of them, it turns out, they would, you know, they would free slaves when they encountered them. And, offer them to join the, uh, the pirate crews and divide up all the treasure equally, all that kind of thing. So anyway, we, we, were, we were really into pirates too. Um, so we operated for about uh, a year and a half until finally uh, the Dunford decision came down. And the FCC won on a technicality. Um, she never got to the question of whether it was the fairest thing, but he had never actually applied for a license. So he did not have the standing to challenge the, um, the regulatory scheme. And uh, so anyway, uh, so 
within a couple of weeks of that, the FCC geared up and they went around the country and they started busting all the pirate radio stations. And we were actually in a meeting uh, across the street from my house with like 50 of our DJs, and we were all like, what are we gonna do if the FCC comes? You know, we're like debating it. You know, you know how these meetings go around, you know? <laughs> Million hypothetical things going on. Who knows what's gonna happen? And then my 17-year-old housemate calls, and she said, um, Petrie, the FCC just came. And I was like, oh no. And I tell everybody, I'm like, this is no longer a theoretical discussion. <laughs> the FCC went to the door just now. And it's kind of funny because um, she's 17 years old. Her parents had been activists. Uh, her, pa her father had helped print newspapers for the Black Panther Party. So she was very well brought up. And so, <laughs> when, so when the FCC came, um, you know, there's always people, when you have a pirate station in your house and 70, 80 people come every week, there's always like people knocking at the door. Hey, dude, FCC, open up. I'm here to bust your pirate radio station. Oh, and she's like, oh, God, yeah, another one of our dumb friends, like just making the dumb, same dumb joke everybody makes when they knock on our door. But something told her this time to look. And she looked on the porch and there were all these police. And there were like, there were actual FCC agents. And they were like, yeah. You know, so she's like, uh, excuse me, who are you? And they're like, FCC, open up. And, and she's like, oh, well, you're going to need a warrant for that. And they're like, well, get our warrant. We'll bust your door down. And she's like, well, you can go do that. And sent them on our way. 17 years old. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> like, you know. Good, good parenting. <laughs> um, so uh, now, what always happens in these situations, you know, when a bunch of kids are like suddenly being chased after by the federal government, um, we ran upstairs, we took all the equipment, we like snuck through the back alleys, we hid in other people's houses, and then um, we got around in a circle again, and then we're like. Um, we're having our meeting, what to do about this, and we're like, you, it's your fault. You talked to that lady that worked for the city paper. Like, no, you, it's your fault. You didn't hide the antenna well enough. And like, we just yelled at each other for like, I don't know, like an hour or two, something like that. But then we came up with like, uh, what we all agreed was a pretty good plan. So we had refused to talk to the press before that, but the next day I got to, get, I got to make the funnest phone call that I've ever gotten to make. And I made it like 50 times, because it's like, you know, it's a press call. So I called all the newspapers and the TV stations in the city, and I said, hello, my name is Pete Treatish, and I'm with the Radio Mutiny Collective. We refused all contact with the capitalist media until yesterday. However, the FCC came, and they threatened to break down our doors for operating a community radio station. We dare them, high noon on Monday, we dare the chairman of the FCC to come on down in front of Benjamin Franklin's printing press, where we are going to turn our pirate radio station back on. So be there. <laughs> no questions. No nothing. <laughs> so um, as you can imagine, a lot of the press, you know, you don't get that kind of call out like every day. So we had um, like all the TV cameras and all the newspapers there. And, um, we had our demonstration, and at that demonstration, we like threw down the gauntlet. We said, um, we put forth a seven point platform for how we were going to make the FCC's life really suck if they did not legalize community radio. And we said that they, we were going to sue them with the ACLU. We said that we were going to have a conference of radio pirates in Philadelphia. We said that we were going to, um, I don't know, we said we were going to do all kinds of things. Um, totally bluffing. No capacity to do almost any of this. <laughs> but, um, but the main thing that we said we would do is that for every station like ours that they came and harassed, we would go around and we would set up 10 more around the country. And we would just drive around and teach people about antennas and microphones and everything like that. And we would create a law enforcement nightmare for them. Um, so that, you know, it, it was kind of great because it kind of put us on the map. They thought, who are these people? Like, you know, they thought we were probably just like teenagers that like all they would have to say is like, very clever son, but 
You know, if you keep on doing that, I'm going to have to tell your mom. <laughs> but, you know, they realized with us that we were quasi-organized and that we thought what we were doing was right and that we were able to, like, put our views out to the media. So, uh, I won't go into all this, but, you know, they came six different times over the course of the next... Oh, this is from that press conference. This is in front of Benjamin Franklin's printing press. And, and what year was it? This was 1998. 1997. We had this big banner that said, 1763, Benjamin Franklin defies the British crown, printing poor Richard's almanac without a stamp from the king, and 1996, radio mutiny defies the FCC for freedom of speech on the airwaves. How can anything like So they kept on coming. They came six times before they finally busted us. Every time we had another press stunt, this one was kind of a fun one. This is a statue of um, Benjamin Franklin at his printing press. And we, uh, we gave him a set of headphones <laughs> uh, and a microphone that said, necessity knows no law, which is a quote from, from Mr. Franklin. I support pirate radio. Um, finally, they busted our station, and that was that. You know, there was nothing. You know, they just came in, they broke in. It was the head of the FCC Enforcement uh, Bureau did us the honor of busting it personally. Um, so, you know, we were all kind of dispirited, but we decided that we would, it was time to escalate and do a pirate march on Washington. And uh, let me see if I can uh, get us to uh, something else. Because um, I actually found a film clip of this. That's kind of funny. They open up for micropower broadcasting, but at the same time, they just busted several stations down in Philadelphia and our own free radio, uh, Memphis. In Miami. In Miami, yeah. 15 stations in Miami. All together, about 200 substations. Yeah, over the last year. So, and, uh, but uh, hopefully, this is uh, to bring a point out. We're going to be right outside in front of them today, protesting from the FCC, broadcasting right in front of them, and telling them to come down here in public, you know, with the media, and, you know, stop doing these backdoor tactics and bring it to a So, this guy is the corporations. Uh, GTE, General Electric, controlling the giant gorilla with the TV for the head. That's the broadcasters, NBC, ABC, CBS. And in turn, the first one, the puppet, that's William Kennard, the chairman of the FCC. Um, we call him Kennardian. demonstration. Obviously, none of us knew very much about Washington lobbying at the time. Um, but that uh, demonstration sort of uh, attracted the attention, first of all, of the Media Access Project, um, who became our lawyers uh, to create the Low Power Fund Service. We met Cheryl Lianza there, who I worked with for the next 14 years on creating the Low Power FM Service. And also, um, it was really funny the chairman of the FCC at the time, we had no idea how he was going to react. But he just totally cracked up. He thought it was the funniest thing that he ever saw. And he, um, for the next six months or so, you know, when you're an FCC chairman, you have to make a lot of speeches to broadcasters associations and everything. 
And most of the time, those chairmen of the FCC, they're like, they tell some story, and it's usually an, an anecdote about golf or football or something like that. But for the next six months, his story was, you know, the other day, there were these crazy radio pirates that came in front of my building, and they said I was a puppet of you guys. And like that, you know, the airwaves all belong to the corporations. Well, I'm going to show them. <laughs> and, um, and so he opened a rulemaking, which is very unusual, and he um, set his engineers on figuring out where there was room, how come these pirate stations were on the air, but not actually really interfering with anything, and, uh, and whether it was possible to, to give out more licenses. And so um, at that point, my job got a lot more boring. <laughs> pictures of it, but um, you know, I worked with the National Lawyers Guild and Media Access Project. We filed a bunch of studies. We hired engineers to sort of prove how receivers work and all that sort of thing. And it culminated in January of 2000 with a new set of rules. Also very, very fast work by the FCC, extremely fast, only a year and a half. To me, at 27, that seemed like like decades, um, but, but everyone told me, You're, this is going really, really fast. We've never seen the FCC work this fast. And they created the low power radio service, and they started taking uh, applications in April of 2000. Uh, it wasn't everything we wanted, but it was pretty good. Uh, you know, there were a lot of channels available, and so we decided we would start just building radio stations. And um, for that, we came up with this idea that we called a radio barn raising. Um, and do I have a picture of that? Yeah, I do. It's on a different screen, I think. But, um, yeah, OK. Yeah. So uh, this is WRYR in Maryland, pretty close to DC. It was, our, it was one of our first stations that we built. And the idea was that we would build a radio station in a weekend with like hundreds of volunteers because there were going to be thousands of radio stations to build and that we would need to like mobilize a lot of people to learn and to, to do it really quick. Um, so, what we, so we started doing those, but then while we were doing that, we totally got blindsided because we thought that we had won, that the FCC had decided in favor of us, but in fact, the, uh, the, the, the NAB had been working behind closed doors, and they slipped some language into an appropriations bill uh, that limited the scope of low power FM. And it took back any of the licenses that would have been granted in the urban areas. Um, and it was through some technical skullduggery, which I won't really uh, explain here. But basically, they redrew the criteria, and they basically said, any radio station that could have been given out in the top 50 markets was revoked. You could still build radio stations in places that had more cows and pigs mm -hmm. listening than people. Um, but, but that essentially, you know, everything that we had fought for was like evaporated. So um, for the next 10 years or so, um, my group, Prometheus Radio Project and I, and a big coalition of allies, um, worked to repeal this bill and to try to change the law and uh, you know allow community radio not just in rural places but also in the cities. Actually, Northampton is one of the larger places that was able to get a community radio license as opposed uh, as a result of this. Um, one thing that we did. Uh, oh, let me go to him first. Judd Gregg was the guy who. Uh, who put that into the law, who slipped it into the appropriations bill. And so uh, in response, we had a barn raising with this group, um, uh, Portsmouth Community Radio in New Hampshire. He was the senator from New Hampshire. And um, Granny D, who is just the awesomest person in the world, um, she, uh, she came, she was running for Senate against um, him. If y'all don't know Granny D, she, walked, she was like, I don't know, 92? when she walked across the country for campaign finance reform. And uh, an incredibly articulate and uh, amazing activist. And she came and talked uh, you know, about, um, she made this great speech about how you know, it used to be that the owner of the radio station was this really ignorant guy, but he lived just you know, down the road from you. And you could go down to his office and argue with him. 
But now, after consolidation, you know, he lived in, in San Antonio, Texas, you know, and like there was no local radio person to argue with anymore. It was just a bunch of robots. So she was, she was really, really, um, really a great person to get involved. Um, um, we also did some barn racing in some pretty rural areas. Uh, Southern Development Foundation, the first civil rights organization to own a radio station, and the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, um, which was uh, uh, a farm workers group that has been fight had been fighting Taco Bell for fair, uh, for fair food and for a penny more per bucket of tomatoes that they, that, that they, they uh, picked. We also did a barn raising here, which was really exciting. Um, my mom came and she took about a million pictures. So I'll just share a couple of them with you from, what is it, eight years ago uh, with Valley Free Radio here uh, in Northampton. Um, this one's a funny one because like the FCC, they kind of, they, they drank the Kool-Aid on Mopar FM and while they had been really against it, um, some of them became very in favor. And that's the, uh, that's me and my friend Kate Coyer. Um, and we're talking with uh, Peter Doyle, the head of the FCC audio division uh, for a radio who came to Northampton. His brother lives up here somewhere. And he actually came and like had a, you know, like an information session during the barn racing. Um, uh, we also kind of did our, uh, the free speech switch again uh, when Valley Free Radio launched. Um, it was like a big like electro thing that when they turned on the station for the first time on Sunday afternoon, they threw this big switch. Um, uh, this is a workshop on DJing. There was a big parade. I was super impressed with how well Northampton turned out for a parade. This went through the streets of Florence. Um, and uh, yeah. There's like a whole bunch of people soldering together the cables for the studio. Um, <clears throat> oh, this was a radio play that they made, just especially for the first broadcast. A bunch of people just threw together a radio play over the course of about six hours. Um, everyone like editing audio, recording audio, um, more of the parade, more of the parade. Um, uh, there's Margo um, and her daughter Amelia, um, who is one of the founders of Valley Free Radio, now living in Seattle. And this guy over here is uh, Michael Cousins, who's one of the like really the greatest lawyers for community radio stations. Um, also a karate expert. Um, <laughs> you really like to have a lawyer who's a karate expert. <laughs> um, uh, kids making puppets. This one was funny. Signs that need to get made. Um, you know, if you can imagine 400 people gathering and us cooking all of our own food and building a radio station, having 50 workshops and all kinds of things. Big work. Um, people of Color Caucus in front of Sojourner Truth in Florence. Um, one of our engineers, a couple of our engineers. More of the parade. Um, whose frequency, our frequency. So anyway, that was, uh, that was uh, Florence about eight years ago for the, for the launch of uh, Valley Free. Um, now, meantime, we're, oh, I should say one more thing about, about Valley Free Radio, which was, you know, when I was still a pirate, I came here to town and uh, a friend of a friend organized an event at the flywheel. And uh, I don't know, like, you know, I got there, even my friend, the friend of my friend did not show up to the event. There were just three people that came. One was Ed Russell, the second was Will Hall, and the third was this crazy street poet who, I forget his name, but who like throughout the presentation would just start like interrupting and sort of spouting beat poetry um, in random moments. <laughs> And like, like after that meeting, I was just I was having one of those moments. Like, what am I doing with my life? You know? I'm, like, I'm like driving around from place to place. Like, I don't even know. Like, three people show up. You know, like, who cares? I don't know. 
But it was a lesson for me because I've had plenty of events where I've talked to hundreds of people and nobody started a radio station. <laughs> um, but those guys totally did it. Ed and well, not the street poet, <laughs> but um, those two started the radio station and became Dodd Free Radio. And by the time I showed up here, they had like 400 people involved. Um, sometimes I joke about that station because like, obviously a couple of poli-sci majors like made up all the rules for it. Um, there, were, there were so many rules. I mean, it was enough to run a small hospital. Um, and, and there was even, a, there were 50 committees, including a committee to determine the jurisdiction and formation of new committees. Yes. Um, so, um, it, like you could have actually, not a small, you could have run a country on the government structure out there. Eventually, um, I think they simplified a little bit and you know, they're, they're still on the air today. Um, okay, so meanwhile, we're doing our campaign, like we're just going around, we're like visiting all these congressional offices, we're having lobby days, we're trying to get this bill passed. And um, uh, one thing that we did was we did the Million Radio March. Um, we all brought like our old radios and uh, you know, had the march on the Capitol. Um, we also had a, like a send your broken radio to your congressman day, um, where we would like just mail all these radios to like certain congressional offices um and uh you know a number of things along the way um finally uh, you know i'll skip all the lobbying because it was terrible um but uh, <clears throat> finally we are we're coming down to the end um it was the fall of 2010 and we were about to lose like there was just like we had passed the house we had passed the Senate Commerce Committee. We had passed the larger, uh, the, the telecommunications subcommittee of the, of the Commerce Committee. Um, and we are on unanimous consent. Most people don't know this, but the United States Senate does 85% of its business on consensus. Um, it's called unanimous consent. And basically because you need floor time to pass a bill, anyone can just pop up and start filibustering. And so what the House Majority, the, the Senate, the, the Senate leader, whatever he's called, what the Senate leader does is he doesn't vote on anything, he just passes things around for unanimous consent. But because he does that, and that process was originally invented for like national ice cream appreciation, <laughs> you know, that kind of like, that kind of thing. Um, but now really most, of, most bills that you see pass go through unanimous consent because there's no way to actually call a vote without inviting a filibuster. So um, we had just about every senator sign off on that, on the bill, but all it takes is one senator anonymously that can put a hold on your bill in that process. And if you have two senators, they can, they can each put a hold for six days, and then the other one puts it on, and then they come off and the other one puts it back on, and they can actually lie to you. Like we went to every office and said, are you the one that's holding the bill? And they all said, no, no. Nope. So you can imagine us going around to every Republican office being like, are you the one that's holding? No, 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 no. You know, and they, they lie to us and, and then we've got to figure it out some other way by getting someone else to snitch on them. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we broke a whole bunch of holds every time we discovered who it was, Wyoming, Texas, you know, like all these different um, horrible states. Um, like, like we would go and get the hold broken and finally we're down to like two weeks before the legislative session ends and like there's nothing we can do. Um, so we decided that we would hold a protest um, uh, there, which was a hula hoop blockade of the National Association of Broadcasters. And we, uh, we basically said stop making community radio jump through so many hoops. Uh, and you know, stop making a circus out of democracy. And so we have this, and let me just show you. Um Backers of Low Power FM community radio stations protested outside the National Association of Broadcasters, or NAB, on Monday to call for the passage of the Local Community Radio Act before the end of the year. The bill has already been approved in the House, but secret holds have been put on the bill in the Senate. 
On Monday, members of the Prometheus Radio Project accused Gordon Smith, the head of the National Association of Broadcasters, of orchestrating the secret holds. As part of the demonstration, protesters hula hooped and juggled outside the NAB offices, chanting, Stop making us jump through hoops. Speaking at the rally um, was Veronica Dorsey of the group United Workers. So, um, yeah, and so what was awesome about this was that uh, I had also been working with a reporter from Politico, uh, which is like the newspaper for The Hill uh, in Washington, D.C., and she had been investigating this for about three weeks, and she not only talked to me, but she, I told her, talk to the cable company. Go ahead and talk to um, the music licensing people, like the musicians organizations. Because it's not just us. The National Association of Broadcasters refuses to budge on any issue. And um, so she talked to them. And sure enough, they said, yeah, the NAB, they're, they're full of it. They never negotiate in good faith. And the music licensing people, yeah, the, you know, the NAB, they've been pulling all these tricks on our issue, too. So she wrote this great article. Um, and in it, there's like basically a quote from uh, a Republican congressman who's like, every week it seems like the National Association of Broadcasters is in here telling me that the sky is falling, that they have to like, you know, that I have to do something to protect their business model, and like I'm just tired of, you know, I, can, I can't tell what's important anymore. And then there was a, something with a Democratic staffer who said, they should really be saving their political capital for things that matter to them, because there's only so many favors we can do for them anymore. And um, two days later, you know, there were like 20 newspaper stories like along, along those lines. And two days later, the, F, the NAB surrendered, and they pulled their last hold on the bill, and the Local Community Radio Act passed. Um, so it was, uh, it was kind of uh, just a really great example of a demonstration really actually being able to turn around the situation. Um, what year was that? That was 2010. And Barack Obama signed it into law on January 4th of 2011. Were you there? Yeah. No, no. He was, <laughs> he was signing all kinds of things, like right around then. Um, yeah, all our, son, our sponsors were like, you really ought to be able to go and see him do that. And he was like, off in, I don't know where it was. But. Um, so, yeah. And so, then it took the FCC a little bit, you know, because Congress passes a statute, but then the agency has to interpret it, and it took them a little while to like do all the actually write the regulations based on the statute. But uh, in October, um, October 15th, yeah, October 15th, the FCC is supposed to start uh, opening up and taking more licenses for low power FM stations, not only in rural areas but also in the cities. Um, however, if you look on FCC's website today to find out about this October 15th filing window, um, you will see, we regret the disruption, but during the federal government-wide shutdown, the FCC is limited to performing duties that are immediately necessary for the safety of life. Um, so the FCC's, uh, even the FCC's website is shut down right now by the Republican government's shutdown. Um, so we're not quite sure if it's going to be October 15th. Um, that the window starts depends on how long this uh, nonsense goes. Um, but, uh, you know, the gears are turning and um, hopefully uh, eventually we'll do it. So, um, you know, I, I promised Martha I would mention one more thing, which is um, the Local Community Radio Act is very narrow in what it does. It's basically just a repeal of an earlier, earlier law. Now, we did do a bunch of negotiation on exactly the character of that repeal, and we went back with, like, I don't know, I've, I helped draft, like, about 30 different versions of that law before it got finalized. Um, but 
One thing it totally does not do is it has nothing to do with like funding or support for community radio. And that is because uh, there are two totally different agencies. You know, the FCC, their jurisdiction is licensing of radio stations on the airwaves. Um, and so their job is uh, to figure out where you can put a radio station without causing interference to another one. Now there's also another agency, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and they are the ones that disperse funds to National Public Radio and, and other organizations. Um, one big problem that we had during all this was uh, National Public Radio was very opposed to low power FM. Um, and Basically, they weren't really, they didn't really care about like the interference stuff. That's what they said they cared about. They were worried that low power FM stations would come along and they would be asked to split up. They get about $100 million a year for public TV and public radio. Um, of that, about $25 million goes to public radio. And of that $25 million, they did not have to share that with like a thousand new local community radio broadcasters. And so what they initially did was they opposed us at the FCC. Like way easier to stop people from getting money from this federal program if they don't have radio stations. Um, so that was their first thing. Now, um, so what we did, our strategy was, we would win at the FCC um, and then later on, like, you know, we would let that worry of theirs like sort of drift away. They would see that we weren't doing anything at the CPB. We weren't. We didn't include any language about that. And then they wouldn't be able to rally their stations to oppose the local community radio act. So that was just what we had to do at the time to get the bill passed. If we had tried to include something about like some fairness in funding or something like that, well then you know it would have been like a bunch of football players or rugby players like on, <laughs> on top of us, and we never would have passed the bill. So, um, so yeah, that's 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 why this is much. And our plan always was that after passing the local community radio act, we would sort of go back and say, well, wait a second, okay, twenty-five million dollars for public radio. Can't you just do like an experimental program or something to like sort of look at new models of public service and all that kind of thing? Um, but it's also at a time when even that $25 million for public radio was being cut every year and sequestered. And so it just wasn't like really in the political radar of the times. It was, it was like a, it was a hard move to make. So um, also the other thing is after we passed the Local Community Radio Act, I said, I am a one bill through Congress kind of guy. <laughs> 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 And uh, I have great successors at the Prometheus Radio Project, you know, and they're, uh, I'm hoping that they're going to like, you know, pursue some of these different kinds of courses. Um, this guy Sanjay Jolly is, is now in the job that I was, you know, doing the advocacy. So, um. Um, we are going to open it up for a QA, and a but before we do that, I did want to thank the Northampton Community Television for videotaping um, Pete's uh, uh, talk and to be airing it pretty soon as well. So and we'll get, if you're interested, we can send you links to, if you want to see that. We also had the opportunity to tape it with Amherst Media uh, in his first talk last week as well, which will also be available uh, on the air and online if you're interested. And also on Monday, Pete uh, did, his, uh, did a wonderful workshop with the Media Justice Network in Western Massachusetts. Uh, and if you're interested in participating or knowing more about that particular network, you can let us know and we can give you more information. But it was a really wonderful workshop on coalition building and experience, the wealth of experience that he's had uh, with that. So I just wanted to mention those few things before we have the Q&A, because I know at some point sometimes people take off and I want to make sure that you all get that uh, information. So with that, we'll, you know, we'll have about like 15, 20 minutes for, for Q&A. And, um, and then we'll you know, wrap it up from there. So. And then, Pete, you're okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just sit down. <laughs> By the way, I don't have a little bit. So, yeah, so you go ahead with your first question. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. Well, oh, the thing I'm most interested <laughs> in is what's going on in Springfield. You know, we have Springfield, West Springfield, 
and Westfield are, are just separated. They're so unorganized. Nothing is going on on the airways. Even the community radio, you know, te television, people seem to be afraid of Comcast to ask, well, you know, you have to more to deal with Comcast, you have to do more than ask. Like, I had been calling them about twice a week to see if we couldn't have access to uh, the airways uh, with their radio station. And, you know, uh, I've forgotten the fellow's name, the lawyer, wouldn't, he said there was no way. And then finally, I said, well, the license was up for renewal. And that I was going to stage a sit-in in the mayor's office if they renewed that present group and didn't include that they should broadcast democracy now. And she knew I was serious. Mm -hmm. So she said, you know, she put it to them. And so they said yes. Uh -huh. And now it's on the television three times a day at 8 in the morning, 12 noon, 7 at night, actually at midnight, mm -hmm. four times a day. And we get it on Valley Free Radio every day, and we get it on WMUA, so that we have six times a day you can access Democracy Now. Oh. And a lot of other good programming has come out of it, because they, she holds, I think, the journalist to a kind of a standard. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of Springfield, um, you know, there is, you know, October 15th is going to be kind of the big, the big moment. October 15th to October 29th. If there is anyone else that wants to build a radio station anywhere in the United States, that's the time to do it. Um, because basically almost all the good frequencies are going to be given out at that time um, in the next couple months. And I'm happy, like, if, there, if there's a group of people, all it has to be is it has to be an existing nonprofit um, that's registered with the state. It doesn't have to be a federal 501c3. It only has to be formally recognized as, uh, as a Massachusetts organization. Um, they can apply. And probably your license won't come out for a year or two, so you've got plenty of time to fundraise and you know, build it up. And uh, you know, for instance, like if uh, you know some a group like Valley Free or WMUA wants to ex extend their coverage more, they're not allowed to have exactly the same programming, but they are allowed to carry quite a bit of the same programming. So they would need their own independent studio or whatever. But they, you know, you can take programming from wherever you want. So you could create a local network. Well, so. tomorrow you'll be doing a workshop actually in Springfield for WGBY. <laughs> We're actually, uh, Pete's coming down and doing a workshop. Great if you would get Jeff Napolitano from AFSC at Oh, we'll definitely send an email. We'll send you yeah. So tomorrow, if you're interested, uh, it's on the flyer, the information in terms of the time and the place. Uh, but there is a group of folks in Springfield that are, are going to be participating, not necessarily in the barn raising and the, the way that we did it here at Valley for Radio, but a workshop that sort of initiates the conversation of how we be do that in, in that yeah, area as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. question. Well, the program. Yeah. 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 No, I was just curious how you contrast this with the internet radio because it's very easy to start up an internet radio station and that's becoming more popular. So do you, how do you contrast the low power of that? <laughs> yes, please pass this around. I'm going to guess this question might come up. <laughs> um, so this article, uh, I just wrote it today. Anyone has any feedback for me? Love to hear it. Um, it's called Radio, the Internet, and the Jetsons. Um, if anyone remembers the Jetsons, the Jetsons was a cartoon from the early 60s. And the funny thing about it is, when you watch it now, it really tells you a lot more about the values of the early 1960s than it does about what the future would be like. Because in the Jetsons, they were like, you would push a button and a car would like pop out of a brief, briefcase and you would push a button and robots would come out of the walls and clean up the whole house for you and everything. And um, whenever people talk about the internet, obviously it's amazing what's happened with the internet in the past 15, 20 years. But everyone is so kind of caught in the glow of it that I think that they kind of 
really miss a big part of what's going on uh, with it. Um, I've heard about a study that described what would happen if in Chicago you had, to, uh, you had every single driver um, listening to an internet radio station instead of uh, listening to regular radio stations. On the highway around Chicago, you would have to build a cell tower every 600 feet uh, with the current technology to send that many streams back and forth uh, of data uh, in the way. Uh, another example, um, uh, William Kling from Minnesota Public Radio, they have a station in Los Angeles. He said, we have this one transmitter, it's like 600 watts, it covers close to 14 million people in the Los Angeles market. Um, if we were to, uh, and we have like whatever, 300,000 listeners currently, you know, listening to that. If we were to send out 300,000 data streams like that, we would pay like five times our national our annual budget on streaming. And it's because like every time that you get a stream from a station, it's like a collect call. Because they have to have, you know, uh, they have to have a stream, they have to have a, a room full of servers, and they have to have a room full of streams. So internet radio is super easy to do when you don't have very many listeners. But when you start gaining listeners and you get up to the scale of what FM can do, now FM, the problem is you gotta pay it all up front. You like build this radio transmitter, you build the tower, but then after that, all you pay is the electric bill and you're kind of done, you know? I mean, you have to have a studio and all that kind of thing. But um, every listener you add with internet radio, you add cost uh, to the transmitter. So um, while there are a million really cool things about internet audio. I'm actually, streaming is one thing, that's cool. I think the real disruptive thing is podcasting because it changes the listener expectation. Um, you know, like with FM radio, you have to like be there at, you know, you have to turn on your radio at 7 p.m. to catch your show on Thursdays, you know. With podcasting, that's gone. You know, you can listen when you want to do it. And that's the thing that I think is going to be like one of the deaths eventually of FM radio. But it's going to take longer than people think. Um, you know, uh, data plans are no longer all you can eat. Data plans now, they charge you by the megabyte, you know, that you download. And so if you actually listened um, to as much audio over the internet, as you would be charged for by going down your cell phone, you would see your bills going up and, you know, so there's like, there are a lot of things that make FM a dramatically, dramatically more efficient means of getting out mass programming. At this point, and probably for like five to 10 more years, um, the internet build out is very, very contentious. No one's quite figured out who's going to be the billionaire as a result of the, of the build-out of broadband. And, and one issue that's totally unresolved is like, like we already see like, a, like a, a kind of a national disaster with texting and driving. So, I mean, just like all these people like, you know, getting into accidents because they can't stop texting long enough to get from point A to point B. Now, if you imagine like trying to listen to internet radio in your car and it's buffering and like you've got to decide whether it's real player or odd warbus or like blah, 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 blah. You know, like the, the internet in the car, it's not, there are two ways it can work. One is they can dramatically simplify the interfaces which will probably give you less choices and will make it less better than FM in the first place or they can make the driverless car. Um, which is clearly also the data and the infrastructure you need to build that out is also five years, seven years, ten years out before like most people are going around in like you know driverless cars. So FM's got I would say five years, ten years to get down. Right now, 92% of Americans listen to FM radio um, for at least. Uh, you know, a bunch of hours per week. Um, uh, I think uh, internet radio, last I looked, was about 32%. So 
something like that. Um, by the time those figures are reversed, you know, I'm no futurologist, but 10 years, something like that, 10 years, 15 years, before the technology, the like infrastructure is out in place to actually make that function, right? So, mm -hmm. thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so I wondered whether we can push this a little bit further, kind of behind, the, you know, beyond the kind of um, technical side, and 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 I wonder whether you could comment a little bit on so community radios clearly occupy a very special activist place, and I wonder whether you think that with digital media that place is kind of being taken away from community radio or, or whether actually digital media m may be able to you know, contribute to the politicization of, of, of these radios? There's ways, definitely. I mean, one thing about community radio is there's generally like 40 radio stations on the dial of any given major city, right? Um, and maybe one of them might be a community radio station. And what happens at the community radio station is that every kind of music or interest group or whatever that doesn't fit in those top 40 stations goes on the community radio station, they all get an hour. So you end up having the like klezmer surf music hour, the Chinese opera hour, the like, you know, all these different programs, which has been the blessing and the curse of community radio because on the one hand, all these places have a place on the dial that they didn't have before. The curse is that the klezmer surf music listeners don't want to listen to the Chinese opera program that's right after it. And so unlike other radio stations that people leave on all day long, like people are always like, oh, this is my favorite show. Oh my God, this show is terrible. Oh my God, this is a great show. Oh my, you know. So that is, um, that was kind of the niche of community radio. And so for some things like reggae, like there are no reggae stations in the entire United States, even though there's like a, millions of people that like reggae. Um, and so community radio, that was the niche of doing all that. Now you can go online and you can aggregate those six million reggae listeners like to an online station. And so it's going to be, that's a challenge for community radio. Um, on the other hand, I think that, uh, I think it has a couple things going for it. One is like the localism that you have of a radio station, like things that are about your town and that kind of thing, you can just like really, really well serve with. Um, another thing is that um, the, uh, the licensing, uh, there's something about having a radio station that's just a little bit more legit, you know? Like what you have, what you have a lot of on the internet is you have like a lot of like teenagers like putting something on a playlist in their closet, you know? Like, and then it runs and like, yeah, it's cool, whatever. What community radio stations have is they have these places where people gather and they work together. The example I, I always like to give with this is WRT in Madison, Wisconsin. They do a community news show called In Our Backyards, and it's on five nights a week. It's about an hour, it's an hour a night, and they have over 100 community producers that are involved in the production of this news program. And they're divided up into like groups, um, you know, so each group is only responsible for like Monday night or Thursday night or whatever. And so while commercial stations, they might have two reporters that go around and cover the cities and go record the mayor cutting the ribbon on the new basketball court, whatever. WRT has 100 people out there always looking for stories. And they only put in two or three hours a week, but they managed to make this incredible newscast out of it. And it's won every journalism award in Matt in Wisconsin for the past, like, I don't know, 15 years. Like, they're always, they've got a couple stories in the top awards that get done. And that's different than, let's say, like, you know, a blogger who's like at home and his fuzzy slippers and a bathrobe, you know, and they're saying whatever they want, and some of them are brilliant, and some of them are, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> but what the community radio station does is it creates that space of collaboration where you make something that's more than just like, 
an individual atomized consumer. And it's more than just like, you know, a thousand people tweeting and retweeting the same thing, you know, but it's a collaborative space for, for media production. And so that's like what I, encur I encourage community radio stations, like, don't think you're going to be the only place where people can listen to reggae anymore, because that's like, that's coming to an end. Um, I mean, for the reason I've described before, you know, 92% still listening to radio. People thought radio was going to end when TV came on in the 1950s. Like, who would want to listen to a radio when you could watch pictures, too? Well, people who are driving. <laughs> um, people who are working on a job site. People who are cooking in a kitchen. People who are cleaning their bathtub. You know, a lot of people want to just listen to audio, and the, the images don't help anything. And FM is kind of ridiculously efficient in like getting music and stories and news to listeners. So it, it's got a little while, you know. It's, I mean, I was telling Martha before, I mean, I talk about this as if we won, right? Because we did, we passed a bill, whatever. The broadcasters, in a different way, they won. I mean, we wanted to do this in 1998, back when radio was different, you know? I mean, radio is no longer what it was in the 1940s when Orson Welles could say the Martians were landing and people would run out on the street and like, you know, be all freaked out. Radio is a small, it's a smaller part of the media mix than it was, you know, at that time. And it's a smaller piece of the mix than it was in 1998. That, it's still a $19 billion industry today. And, you know, so it, it's got a little time to be in there. Also, I kind of like it because it's like a little off the radar. People that read Wired magazine don't think that it works anymore, but like other than that, lots of people are still listening to it. So, um, yeah. Other questions? I just wanted to mention that actually, um, you know, the, um, as a result of the LPFM uh, legislation and sort of the opening up of those smaller airways, there was someone who used to work on WCR, uh, Luis Melendez, who had Tertulia, which was on Sunday afternoons, and participated in Valley Free Radio. He ended up moving back to Puerto Rico and mobilized the community in Vieques to actually apply for a low power radio station license. And they were doing a lot of, you know, sending out a bunch of emails, like, you know, the fundraising piece. Um, but it officially went on this summer. Yeah, and yeah. so in Vieques, actually that low power radio station is really important because it's also providing news and information what's happening on that smaller island, but also in, in Culebra, which is the next island, and then some part of Puerto Rico as well. So that in fact there's, a, you know, he's been running it and working with a collaboration of people and also, you know, the, the Navy left Vieques, you know, um, like a decade ago, but in terms of the environmental and it sort of destruction that all that bombing did there is something that the people have been sort of working through and so forth. So that the capacity building that was generated also here at this very local level is now you're seeing the, the sort of benefits of that and sort of aftermath somewhere far away as Vieques mm -hmm. uh, because someone was participating here and taking the lessons learned from here onto the island and then also providing programming all in Spanish. So that's the other piece too, is that it's not just in English, but there's a, a you know Spanish language low power radio station, you know, in Vietnamese as well. So you know, I think that that's important in terms of what are the what are the possibilities and and the opportunities that it still provides, particularly in places like in Vietnam that doesn't have broadband, mm -hmm. and so uh, and is not is not on the grid in that particular kind of way. Um, so that the low power really becomes important. Another people, person who really worked very hard on the project is Libby Reinish, who uh, worked at Free Press and now uh, at the Software Foundation. But she um, sort of walked him through the application process while she was interning at Prometheus mm -hmm. for a long time. So we're really, really excited. You know, that was like one of our favorites. Like, we're like, oh my god, a radio station in the case. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I think that I wanted to just point out that um, you know, the passing of the radio act is important also to create a framework at a federal level for community-based, uh, you know, projects. I mean, I see it just not just as a radio, you know, it's something that I think that it could be worked in the future, like uh, how, uh, as a president for other uh, aspects, around the world, not just like, a, you know, like in, in Europe, uh, they have actually new 
regimes protecting and fostering community radio emerging in the last 10 years. The reckon actually uh, from the European community they have right now a standard for that. So uh, this is the, I see it as a springboard and it's up to communities, I would say, to advance in it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, very cool. Anything else? No. Yeah, we have to on time. <laughs> <laughs>